I'm going to try and apply Marx's theory to the current crisis. That's, that's the purpose, of, and to use his methodology and tools, and, uh, you know, including the, the uh, labour theory of value, and uh, to to uh, to explain the crisis. But I'm not going to directly address some of those sort of some of the theoretical stuff, like the relevance or weight of the tendency of the rate of profit. Fall, uh, which is uh, which. Although I accept uh, the theory, I think people have tried to turn it into a sort of a, a, a the only explanation for crises, which I think is a problem, or uh, the problems associated with the monthly review school, who I think have an incorrect monetary theory and essentially accept the modern mon essentially accept the sort of modern mo money theory as the only form of as a as as uh, part of their theoretical framework and are semi or Keynesian in my view problems. I'm not going to directly deep either of those, but I've got a little booklet here that does that I'm going to give people later. Um, but I'm going to just press ahead looking at this crisis and how using Marx, I think we can explain it uh, much better than is being done by bourgeois economists or much of the those who say they're being Marxists. So the, inf the inflation blame, blame game is back and it's very relevant to Marxist crisis theory. Inflation is back worldwide and with it is the blame game. So what is the truth behind the claims and counterclaims that are being made? Um, so a little background. An impending worldwide recession in late 2019 foreshadowed by a freeze in the United States repo markets led the US Federal Reserve to embark on a major amount of money printing. Interest rates were pushed down to free up credit. Then in early 2022, public health measures uh, taken in response uh, to COVID, uh, including economic close-down, which were imposed to stop the pandemic spreading further, but it, this seriously disrupted world production and trade. Both money printing by central banks across the globe and government budget deficits were massively expanded to cope with the crisis. Interest rates were driven below zero in some cases. People were actually being paid to borrow money. Imagine. The monopolies dominating global production and trade also seized on genuine or manipulated shortages to impose price gouging wherever they could. The profits of energy companies, for example, simply exploded as a consequence. Most central banks, including the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, um, ignored the growing inflation at first and sought to blame temporary supply chain disruption for the price increases. Right-wing economic and political voices schooled in the monetary school of thought which say inflation is always a monetary phenomenon, although none of them agree on what money is, actually, um, they stay silent. They sense that their system had dodged the bullet of a broader economic collapse. I think they were also uh, pleased by the extraordinary explosion in global asset wealth of the ruling class that kicked in over late 2020 and through 2021 as a factor of muting their criticism. But the monetarists were allegedly in charge of economic and monetary policy in 2008 when the US Federal Reserve started the process of money printing dubbed quantitative easing for the first time round to get out of the deepest crisis of world capitalism up to that point in, since the 1930s Great Depression. At that time, in 08, they had ignored their theories to save their system then. It seemed to work that time without triggering broader inflation uh, than in assets in particular. There is asset price inflation, but uh, not broader, uh, uh, price, not broader uh, price inflation. So maybe it would work this time. They were hopeful in 2019, 2020, that it would work again. But today we have, that, we, we have inflation averaging 9-10% over much of the globe. 
These are numbers not seen for decades. Turkey, Argentina, Sri Lanka have inflation rates of 60 to 80 percent. There is now a risk that continuing those policies will unleash hyperinflation in the US dollar in particular, which will destroy its value and end its role as a dominant world currency. From the point of view of the 1% owners of the world's wealth, that must be prevented at all costs. Hyperinflation was threatened once before in the late 1970s when US inflation hit 13% and there was a flight from the dollar into gold which doubled its value over a few months in late 1979. This required what was dubbed the Volcker shock in the name of the then US Federal Reserve Director Paul Volcker who stopped uh, easing the monetary expansion that was going on at the time and restored confidence in the dollar by pushing the Fed's official interest rate to 20%. Do you imagine? The Federal Reserve rate. All other rates, of course, would go above that. <coughs> Government spending on welfare and education was also targeted for cuts at that time. Austerity budgets became the norm. Aiming for a budget surplus became economic orthodoxy across capitalist nations, although this was only uh, achieved temporarily in the US, given the demands of its permanent wars of empire across the globe. After the inflationary 1970s in New Zealand, we had our version of the Volcker shock under the new Labour government elected in 1984, and official interest rates reached an all-time record high of 18%, the official cash rate and variable mortgage rates went 20% or more. Now, this is the origin of financialization. Capitalists who were in the business of lending money and deindustrialization, right? capitalists who were in the business of lending money rather than producing goods were massively advantaged by higher interest rates. There is also no reason to open a business unless the profit rate is above the cost of money. Marx explained in Capital that a capitalist will never invest in new production unless the profit of what he called the profit of enterprise is above the rate of interest, and therefore able to generate at least the average rate of profit for that investment. That is the economic origin, I say, of financialization. That's why General Electric became GE Money. The 1% don't care how they make their money. But accumulated wealth needs to be stored in both financial and non-financial ass assets. Historically, this was broadly 50-50 share, but a gap has opened in favour of financial assets since 2008. But the 1% hate inflation with a passion as it reduces their financial asset value by that percentage or more. Would every if working people also get angry at price increases and may join protests and strikes to protect their living standards. In the normal circumstances, central banks will move to raise interest rates and slow the economy to stop inflation occurring. This will at least temporarily hurt profits at share market prices, but that's just a consequence of their monetary policy. But in 2008 and 2020, central banks tried to keep the economy from contracting further than it already had in 2008, or was expected to in 2020, by printing money through what is known as QE. But, as I said, this didn't result at that time in too much inflation happening, as the recession had already essentially started in the US when they did this. So the money, rather than being put in general circulation, was hoarded or used to pay debts between each other. Couldn't boost spending more broadly. But the, but the latest round of QE involved both central bank money printing and government budget deficits to save the system. The money was also, this time, given to ordinary people to spend. Inflation was inevitable. It is the owners of wealth that determine central bank and government policies on these matters. And the war on inflation will continue as long as necessary um, and justified as essential for the nation's economic survival. 
For right-wing politicians and their economic thinkers dubbed in them from the monetary school, the economists have rediscovered their orthodoxy and are now uh, targeting too, you know, too much money printing, too much government spending, workers' wages, although well, it's more of a Keynesian argument, workers' wages are too high, and, uh, and, but, and unfortunately they are correct in a sense in, this, in terms of this uh, 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 money printing. But as I said, they don't, they're not actually sure what money is, so they can't, they're not sure what to target. Um, but they should be challenged for uh, why they say sign up. Now in the 70s, the principal means of creating money and fueling inflation was to run budget deficits. Um, the US also needed to do this to finance the war in Vietnam. Now the economic orthodoxy known at that time became what became known as Keynesianism uh, after the US economist John Maynard Keynes. Now Keynes was an upper class classical pro-capitalist free market economist. Um, but he, he accepted there was something wrong with the, with the system since depression, which his theory said couldn't happen, did happen. Um, and he sought a way to mitigate the uh, occurrence of the recession or depression, and he saw he and he thought the the state should intervene to lower interest rates or do deficit spending to stimulate uh, the economy um, for demand and employment. Our own prime minister at the time, in the early nineteen late seventies and early nineteen eighties, Robert Muldoon, was a classical right wing, right wing racist and dogmatic sort of person, but. He was a he was a Keynesian. He and run, ran big, big budget deficits uh, to uh, finance uh, uh, social and other expenditure. Um, Nixon, uh, uh, another racist, you know, pro proclaimed himself, "We're all Keynesians now." He said, but Keynes was not a friend of the workers, as many people mistakenly think. And, uh, and, uh, and had a sort of a cost plus cause for inflation where, so essentially the only way to bring inflation down was to cut wages. How, so, however, in the period after World War II, these budget deficits that Keynes promoted and, and the government policies essentially sort of adopted that's being necessary, uh, became endemic. And the end result was dubbed stagflation, a combination of economic inflation uh, and, uh, or, sorry, economic stagnation with inflation. My view, this is the worst of both worlds for working people because wages are cut by inflation while our ability to risk resist is undermined by high unemployment. That's why socialists don't favour Keynesian policies over monetarist policies. It's the capitalist system and its inevitable crises that is the problem, not the policies designed to manage that crisis. After the Volcker shock, Keynesians were removed from operational control and replaced by adherents of the monetarist school. The principal theorists of monetarism from the University of Chicago School of Economics led by Milton Friedman. Um, as well as wanting, wanting to control inflation, they were also radical free market dogmatists who favoured austerity for workers, free trade in goods, free movement for capital, free interest rates and privatisation of everything, including education and the healthcare system. They also supported eliminating the minimum wage and unions, which because they interfere with the market. The Act Party in, in New Zealand, currently on 10% in the poll, is an adherent of the school. They favour tax cuts for the rich and regressive con consumption tax on us. With the monstrous in charge, budget deficit financing was sharply curtailed, especially on ascending spending that assisted working people like welfare, health, education. Infrastructure spending is often starved. Central banks like the New Zealand one were made independent with the exclusive goal of targeting inflation to uh, keep it low 
And uh, the money supply was to be controlled through interest rate increases. Each time the economy started growing a little and unemployment began falling. Conveniently for the right-wing political leaders, their theories are also deeply anti-working class. The Chicago boys were invited to Chile to transform the economy in favour of the rich under the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet after he seized power from the socialist-minded government in a coup in 73. And the, the, uh, the, just a horror story was imposed on, on the working class of Chile, but uh, Freeman uh, happily went there to pose with Pinochet as, a, as uh, his policies being some sort of success story. The UK followed Chile's policies under Thatcher in 79, the US under Reagan in 81, New Zealand in 84, as I said, by the Labour, Gov Labour Party uh, uh, Finance Minister Roger Douglas. These policies were sort of dubbed neoliberalism, neo to mark them off from the Keynesianism of the previous period. Now, it's theoretically possible for a government to stop budget deficits and fight their inflationary action, uh, impact by taxing the rich or eliminating war budgets, uh, but no capitalist government from that time particularly tried to do that course of action. Adherence of monetarism and free market governments were put in charge of every aspect of government policy. Uh, you can get, every time there's a sort of we have a minimum wage discussion in New Zealand, one of the government economists will do a report, it's going to lead to unemployment, and for the last 20 years it hasn't, right? In New Zealand, we've been, and the minimum wage has gone from 40% of the average wage to 60% of the average wage. But um, yeah, we've got the lowest unemployment in, at the moment, pre crisis, it's always the lowest, just pre crisis, but I think uh, we've got the lowest unemployment uh, at the moment ever. But as I said before, the monetary side of these policies were abandoned almost overnight in 2008 when the crisis hit. It was considered necessary to stop a system-wide collapse of the banking and financial system. There was a very major partial collapse of the system. Banks went every, you know, from the US and Europe and uh, Ireland, um, all But with QE, all forms of debt exploded across the globe. But this was seen as the price of the rescue of the of rescuing that profit-seeking system. But the recovery, so we have this huge QE happening, but the recovery that followed uh, across most of the globe was the slowest in the history of capitalism. It was becoming also becoming clear that the world, so that sort of decade through to 20, sort of a pro prolonged, it was a longer sort of cycle, if you like, than normal, um, um, but, it was, but, but, it was, uh, but it was one of the weakest right, uh, in the history of capitalism. And it was becoming clear that the world was gearing up for uh, another crisis in late 2019, um, you know, with inventory growth and and, uh, and, and another repo crisis at that time. You saw so, so, repo sort of overnight market for money for, for within the banking system. And if you, if, you're not, if you don't trust each other overnight, there's a problem with that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that problem would re-emerge. It emerged in 08, emerged in 2019. And then the pandemic hit. <clears throat> the capitalist rulers knew they needed new doses of money printing and government spending to save their system. But they hadn't, in the period of that long cycle, they hadn't done what they had promised, which was to withdraw the QE that had occurred previously. Every time they went to slow it down a little, the system froze up, their credit system froze up. So the capitalists, so they knew they needed a new doses of money printing to, to save their system. Now capitalists only produce if they can sell goods for a profit. They only lend money if they feel they can get their money back with interest. <sighs> Essentially today, the state, in almost every country, has stepped forward in order to protect those profits whenever they get threatened. Now, a central bank can create money, 
by simply printing it electronically. But what that gets used for is, some, is, some, is something that can be different in different periods. During the most recent crisis, the US used the money to buy up bonds from distressed banks and, and industrial corporations to prevent them from going under. In New Zealand, $28 billion was given virtually free to the banks to lend directly to whoever they wanted. And they gave most of it to property speculators uh, um, who were borrowing for mortgages, and house prices went up 30% in one year. Another $100 billion was made available to the government to prop up businesses during the, the pandemic. This allowed the government to run big budget deficits without horrendous interest rates being demanded, at least initially, by the private financial capitalists for the bonds they were issuing to finance the debt. Now, this is unorthodox by any measure, but was considered necessary when everyone was crisis hit. Now we're being told by the central banks that we've got to return to more orthodox policies over the medium term. And the return to orthodoxy means the central banks must seek to retire the bonds that had created by buying them back, and they need to push up interest rates to do so. But in the, ex in the absence of taxes of wealth, the budget deficits are also being targeted because they create additional spending artificially. It's a form of money creation, uh, but different from the central bank printing money directly. But reducing these deficits inevitably will be contractory for the economy. We are technically in recession in New Zealand, right? This, this has produced a recession. We've had two quarters of negative growth. Very minor recession, unemployment's still low. Um, but I suspect it'll get significantly deeper because I said there's, there's a coming together of, I think, European recession, US recession, and one in New Zealand. I'm sure, I don't know about Australia. You, can, you seem to be able to escape. The most, <laughs> with the help of, of a very large country up there, you get you, you, uh, you have a But New Zealand will not. We, you know, you have, I assume you have, but you still have uh, sort of trade surpluses, um, and we, we've got a we've got a deficit that's eight percent of GDP. So we're going to be crushed by this sort of uh, uh, slowdown in world trade and so on. And uh, but anyway, that's another thing. Um, <coughs> uh, But the crisis that's coming has been made vastly more dangerous uh, by the escalating uh, debt levels of that previous few decades. US debt um, is the most important indicator of this process because of the weight of the US economy. From about 60% of GDP before the 2007 crisis exceeded double, more than 130% after the 2020 recession. In the EU, the debt-to-GDP ratio was 88%. At the end of 21, it's now you know, well over 100%, um, although official policy is, can be no larger than 60% in Europe. But it's, on a global level, according to the IMF, global debt rose by 28 percentage points to 256% of GDP in 2020 alone course of one year. The public debt is around 100% across the globe. So, 200, so global debt, 256% of GDP. At the end of World War II, after the huge spending of all governments across the globe, um, uh, it was around 100% of GDP. Um, and it remained around that level until the 1970s. The avalanche of debt appears to be acting, uh, rather than stimulating growth, is acting uh, as a brake on the system. Uh, and the rising interest rates, which will be continuing for some time, will push banks, financial institutions, into, into, into collect we're already seeing the beginning of, right? Uh, major corporations and whole countries into default. And it's affecting uh, corporations. 
Uh, Morgan Stanley says around uh, sort of 20% of US companies are what they call zombies. Um, highly indebted companies hanging on by a thread. And uh, zombie debts in the US are 900 billion. And uh, um, the, the, the zombie companies, where they, where, where they, they're only just earning enough to service their debt. Right? No, they're, not, they're not earning it. It's a sort of profit. Right? And these would be the. Um, but um, De <coughs> Deutsche Welle says that uh, European, that 20% of European companies are technically zombie companies. So high interest rates, which are coming, getting higher, um, mean the end of cheap money, obviously. Much more difficult for any company or country to uh, or individuals to access, uh, to refinance the debts they have. So defaults will become more common and mass layoffs will become uh, inevitable. So we're also being hit by double whammy of war, um, induced shortages and price rises for basic food, fertilizer and other commodities, which will accentuate the downturn. And the US currency is arising against most others because there is a flight to capital for the safety of the world's biggest and safest financial market, which means poor countries have to repay their debts in a, in a more expensive dollar. Um, uh, Oxfam says that there's sort of, uh, so essentially a debt crisis with at least 23 countries in the global south and the IMF is approving loans to them by demanding a skip, as they always do. <coughs> Hundreds of million people now, with a global food crisis, energy crisis, so, you know, hundreds of million people are simply going hungry. Um, which the Oxfam talks are witnessing the most profound collapse of a humanity into extreme poverty and suffering in memory. Number of people going to increase in you know, extreme hunger increased by 80 million to 325 million. The last crash in 2007-8 produced the, the protests, of, you know, the uprisings in 48 countries across the globe, and uh, but yeah, this one will. Uh, it's going to be worse for much of the globe, and we can expect a similar response. Hungry people, in a sense, have no alternative but to, but to fight. <coughs> the climate crisis has been that we are living through permanently, has of course been compounded by. Uh, the, ca the capitalist crisis and imperialist war driving up the production of planet-destroying energy sources rather than leading to alternatives to it being sought. The capitalists, are, the capitalists seek profit. That's their purpose for existence. If the profit is in fossil fuel, they'll seek profit there. Um, they have no choice in the matter, in a sense. <clears throat> now, the current crisis is the is a product of what we talked about, overproduction of commodities in the COVID aftermath boom. Uh, capitalists were cautious about accumulating in inventories and investing in after the 2007-9 crisis, which made it, you know, the recovery slower, as I was talking about. This prevented a new worldwide overproduction crisis for some years at the price of lingering unemployment and eroding living standards. Stagnation appeared to be the new norm. People talked about that in some of the left-wing economic writings. Um, but as I mentioned before, by late 2019, the signs of a new crisis were developing, causing a spike in interest rates, although the situation didn't reach crisis immediately. Then came COVID, and the shutdowns forced underproduction of commodities uh, to a greater extent than a normal recession would have done. Um, and a forced reduction of inventories to a more significant extent than a normal recession. So when the shutdowns were eased, the boom began 
the boom began to develop, which re to rebuild inventories and demands for commodities soared. Demand exceeded supply at prevailing prices, resulting in high prices and higher profits. There was a rise in demand for labour power across the globe. Wages didn't keep place with inflation, as usual, and so real wages declined. Uh, the blog I've been working with in a, a US blog called The Critique of Crisis Theory highlighted the exhilarating signs of crisis um, in May. Uh, they said the massive overproduction resulting from the COVID aftermath boom has pushed the economy to the brink of what would become a deep recession. This is shown by the collapse of the four regional banks in the US, as well as leading indicators say, such as the relationship between short and long-term interest rates called the yield curve and, and measures which in, inverted in New Zealand also have inverted, um, and measures of the uh, money supply, dollar bills, coins and bank deposits that function in currency. So the yield curve has not been so inverted, short-term interest rates higher than long-term since the early 1980s. The global money supply, a predictive approach to assessment, has also been contracting at rates not seen since the 1930s. The upper crisis, super crisis in the 1930s. If this was not enough, the dollar price of gold has been above $2,000 for several weeks, as I write the lines, he says. It's significant is that if the Federal Reserve System tries to stave off the system by moving to reverse the contraction of the global money supply, a run on the dollar could develop that has the potential to sink the dollar-denominated international monetary system, financial foundation of the US empire. Many countries have built, are building up their gold reserving and taking other steps to reduce their dependence on the dollar. Whenever a, gl a global crisis of overproduction of commodities approaches, governments come under pressure to limit their borrowing and spending. When plenty of money and credit is available, central governments can borrow without reducing the quantity of loan money available for the rest of the economy. But when loan money starts to dry up as it does just before a recession, government borrowing accelerates the credit crunch in the economy. Now, there are laws that capitalism must obey. The first great economic thinkers associated with the, well, well, finish it, associated with the birth of the system were Adam Smith and Ricardo. They explained how the system worked. Smith coined the term the invisible hand. Uh, the pro-capitalist in site Investopedia explains, the invisible hand is a metaphor for the unseen forces that move the free market economy. Through individual self-interest and freedom of production as well as consumption, the best available interests of society as a whole are fulfilled. The constant interplay of individual pressure on market supply and demand causes the natural movement of prices and the flow of trade. The invisible hand is based on their, uh, uh, their belief in the labour theory of value. They both both of them had a, a, a labour theory of Smith and Ricardo accepted. And Karl Marx incorporated this labour theory of value and improved on it in his own writings. Um, Marx showed in Capital that prices, exchange values, are the form that labour values take. But as always, there's a contradiction between appearance and essence. Aggregate market prices can diverge from aggregate labour values, or at least if they were accurately represented the labour values. During a boom, prices drift above values. During a crisis, they drift below values. Marx corrected the classical labour theory of value to show that a commodities price did not oscillate around a natural pace based on actual labour time, but around a price of production that took account of the ratio of labour and capital compared to the average and the turnover time. So an individual commodity goes to the market to see what claim it can make on society's finite labour time. In total, aggregate values must equal aggregate production prices. However, the credit system divorces the act of purchase from the act of paying. Lenders can lend more than they have, they leverage. 
This pushes up Asian market prices above their respective countries' labour values. Now, in this situation, claims are being made on future labour time through credit that may never be realised. In a boom, everything depends on things going well, and leverage continues to increase until what's dubbed the Minsky moment, a sudden collapse in value, and some lenders start to panic and they may not get their money back. We then get credit crunch, financial crises, and recession. The law of value acts. Marx's theory, contrary to myth, fully integrates uh, the market as the value of commodities cannot be known until it comes to the market. That is, the actual amount of labour time inherent in a commodity that gives it value, um, rather than... Uh, <coughs> it isn't the actual amount of labour time in the, that... that it's rather the amount of society's finite labour time that it can claim in the marketplace. Value has to be recognised in price. Before fiat money, <coughs> capital uh, devaluation was obvious and price deflation. Um, with fiat money, we get currency devaluation. Um, and But prices rocket in terms of Gold. The currency devalues in terms of gold, so the price of what's well, term the price of gold goes up. That's, what, that's why gold still features the financial markets, because it is what it is a bearer of labour time in a commodity, measure of value, as distorted as it may be. There are three types of money essentially in society. Um, <clears throat> So understanding the interaction of three types of money, these are, uh, as explained by Marx, right? One form is gold, which is a product of human labour uh, that has emerged as the universal equivalent of all other commodities as a measure of value. Right? All societies with a developed system of commodity production and society need a universal equivalent to function. Uh, gold uh, can also be hoarded for its intrinsic value especially in times of monetary disorder. Gold does not disappear in a crisis. It always retains its value through any crisis. Capitalists and central banks hold a portion of their wealth and reserves in gold because of these special properties. The second form of money is token money, issued by the state, dubbed fiat money, the economists. So long as this form of money, the, uh, the fiat money isn't over-issued relative to the existing quantity of gold, the currency, whether it be a dollars, pound, euro, rupees, can retain its value as long as it's backed up by state power, which can impose taxes to sort of fuse force or to make people doing its business. But if currencies are over-issued, they lose value in proportion to the over-issue. In normal circumstances, a doubling of token money will result in a halving its individual value. The currency price of gold will double effectively reflecting that change. <coughs> this is the origin of the general inflation we saw in the 70s and early 80s. They tried to escape gold's sort of role um, by going off the gold standard. And, uh, uh, and they believed that the monetarists and Keynesian believed there would be a collapse in the price of gold because the demand for it no longer is the state is no longer uh, demanding. They saw gold as a shackle restricting their ability to manipulate the economy, both of them. But the price of gold exploded, as we have seen, to you know, from $35 an ounce to $120 an ounce, and now $2,000 an ounce. Now, this token money can be expanded at a relatively steady pace, say 2% a year. Um, uh, uh, I think that you know, it sort of needs to match the sort of overall gold production that occurs in the world economy. Um, but if you over-issue uh, it, then it gets devalued. If there were no objective limits to the creation of token money, and credit money, there would never be a crisis of overproduction every 10 years like we have seen. 
Um, now, monetarists don't understand the different forms of money, right? They treat gold, credit money, and token money as essentially the same. Keynesian also don't understand the different forms of money and why gold retains its essential role as a measure of value in economic life. So they operate, how much they issue, they operate by a bit, essentially trial and error, you know, I think largely. Um, they sort of, and to, to what the, what, you know, you know, because they don't know exactly what they're sort of controlling. You know? um, <clears throat> now, the, the, this is the third form of money is credit money. Now, under a developed system of finance and credit, this credit money is created and centralised by the banks who are making loans. They are able to use deposits of token money created by the central bank as a base from which to expand lending uh, many times over the actual sums deposited to, to customers. So long as everyone doesn't want their money back at the same time, the merry-go-round can continue. It's called fractional reserve banking. But banks are profit-making competitive businesses. Built-in tendency seek more and more creative ways to uh, create and extend credit to maximise their returns. Derivatives are the latest kind of, sort of like an insurance case, don't go bad, are the latest example of that. But when a crisis happens, so credit can disappear, right? The, it's, it evaporates, right? Uh, or it can evaporate. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, it is uh, uh, a sort of a fictional, uh, it's not real money like gold, and it can disappear without a trade. In fact, the over-issue of credit must be periodically um, uh, <coughs> must be per periodically neutralised to restore the system to balance, right? A, a section of the social issue. What they are trying to do by preventing these credit collapses is preventing the law of value doing its work, preventing the uh, and preventing the restoration of balance into the system. But instead of producing new spurts of growth in the system, they have turned the system into a system of permanent stagnation and increased the the, the risk associated with each new collapse to almost. Uh, Unprecedented levels, which is the world we are currently in. Europe. Okay. Uh,